Hello everyone and welcome back to another Facebook Live webinar today. This is our May webinar coming live to you. Um, on behalf of Spokal, I really want to thank you so much for giving up your Saturday um, to spend time with us. And we're terribly excited and thrilled to have Cheryl Dixon back with us today for part two. Um, I'll go, I'll reintroduce Cheryl in just a moment. Um, so, I'm one of the co-founders of Spokal, and Spokal is an app that supports children who might be struggling with language development, social skill development, they may have a hearing loss, or other challenges in terms of communication. In our app, we have hundreds and hundreds of activities and ideas for you to do at home. If you're a professional, go to our app and get lots of ideas and strategies. Um, if you're a parent, then all those strategies are there along with hierarchies of development to support you in supporting your child in their communication development. So you can find our app in the App Store. Now, it gives me absolute great pleasure to welcome back Cheryl Dixon. Uh, Cheryl is a colleague and a friend of mine. We've known each other for many, many years. Um, Cheryl is um, a certified auditory verbal therapist and has been working within the space of hearing and hearing impairment for many years. And she'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, Cheryl's experience spans Australia, but also international. Um, Cheryl was the past president of the Alexander Graham Bell Academy. That's an incredibly important position. Um, and through her leadership, they developed many amazing strategies for the academy. And the academy is where therapists certify for auditory verbal therapy, either as a teacher or as an early intervention therapist. Um, so without further ado, Cheryl, welcome back to part two um, of our webinar. So we're obviously carrying on from last week. Cheryl, I wondered just very quickly, because we may have some new uh, people joining us, if you just introduce yourself, sort of where you live. I can tell you Cheryl lives in amazing Australian bushland, over 100 acres. So Cheryl, welcome back. Thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you very much to Spokal for asking me to, to speak again. Part one was lots of fun, and I, I hope part two will, will help everyone kind of put the finishing touches on what we talked about. Uh, yes, I live in the Snowy Mountains, and it's just beautiful here on our acreage. Uh, my husband and I live with our dog, Crystal, who you see there. She's a a rescue schnauzer with one eye and three teeth. So she, um, she's had an interesting life, but she's landed in a very good, safe place with us now. And we also um, raise orphaned kangaroos. We're part of an organization called Laoko. So my husband and I uh, take care of orphaned kangaroos. And you see my husband Guy there with Miss Ruru, and I'm holding Robbie Roo and we've had them for just about a year now and they're ready to just about ready to go off on their own miss ruru is um really ready to go off on her own i might say she's a bit promiscuous but robbie ru is still a mama's boy and he comes home to me every night and and wants a cuddle still even though he's quite a big boy now those photos are are probably eight months old or so yeah now, a little bit about uh, about my background uh, professionally, Andrew. Yes, okay. Yes. So I was originally um, trained in America, and I trained as an auditory verbal therapist. It, it's, it's like, Andrew, it's like over 30 years ago, if you can imagine. Just I, unbelievable. We were honestly both around the age of 15 when we started. <laughs> That's right. Perhaps me 10. <laughs> But I, um, I just was so lucky that I was um, where I was back in the day to learn about auditory verbal therapy. And 
it just, um, even though I was trained in total communication, and I totally believe in, in all modes of communication for children with hearing loss or children with um, additional difficulties, whatever it takes to, to help a child achieve language, whatever kind of language that is. But this, this training really helped me to uh, develop the skills that that I then applied to a, a wide audience, um, a, a wide uh, caseload later in my, my career. And I've written things for Andrew when he worked at, at Cochlear, the Sound Foundation uh, series, which uh, if you haven't seen it yet, go find it. And, um, you know, written chapters in books and created um, a number of things that might help you with your children. So. You can go to my website and have a look. You can look at Cochlea. You can look at other manufacturers' websites. Andrew's had a lot of input around the world as well. So if you see the name uh, Kendrick or you see the name Dixon, you're bound to find something that can help you with your child. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. So this is part two of the current level of function form that Cheryl has created um, around listening and language. Now, Cheryl, I just want to explain to the audience. So you and I both obviously worked extensively in the field of hearing and hearing impairment. However, your current level of function form um, and the theory behind it and the strategies and the application um, is not limited to children with hearing loss. It's actually a really great tool to use with children who have communication challenges of any sort. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so it definitely it started with me trying to help therapists that were working with children with hearing loss so that they could figure out where is each child on their caseload? Where are they functioning? And then they can write goals so that they can move that child along and hopefully get rid of the delay if one was present. And 40% of, of all children with hearing loss have an additional difficulty. So immediately the form had to be used with uh, all types of uh, children with a variety of disabilities. And it, it was very apparent from the beginning that the form just helped parents and helped therapists figure out any child, regardless of their difficulties, any child's uh, current level of functioning. So you just look at the child and you find out where they're functioning in language, where they're functioning in speech, where they're functioning in their general development. And if they have a hearing loss, you also look at their audition or their listening skills. But even ch children without hearing loss, uh, you need to look at their listening skills because not all children um, can uh, learn through audition. They need additional support and you would find that out by using this form and, and filling it in. Great, thanks Cheryl for, for making that really clear. Now before we, before I ask Cheryl just to recap on what we talked about last month, so it'll be a, a brief recap um, on mm -hmm. part one of the current level of function. Um, we did receive a number of questions last month that we were unable to answer um, because we really wanted to wait for those questions to be part of part two. So there's a couple of questions that we that you asked last month that we will answer at the end of um, this current uh, webinar. So I'm now going to ask Cheryl just to recap on the current level of function uh, that we talked about last week. I'm going to bring up the form now. Thanks Cheryl, if you could just give us a recap on last month's webinar, please. Yep. So we talked, we started at the top of the form and worked our way down. And just to briefly recap, the very top section of the form, you, you write in your child's name and their date of birth. You would uh, then calculate their chronological age and put the current date on the form because we want the form filled out all at once so that it is an actual snapshot in time of your child's functioning abilities. 
And where I have device and aid at age and implant age, you don't have to put anything there if your child doesn't have a hearing loss. You could put other information in there, such as the type of program that they attend, if they have any special modifications that someone might need to know about um, when they read this form so that they can learn about your child quickly by just glancing at this one page form. We also talked about the Ling sounds, and that is just access to the speech spectrum. So if your child doesn't have any hearing loss or any auditory processing uh, problems, then you could leave that, that blank as well, or put in any other adaptive information that, that you need to so that a person understands your child completely. Under hearing loss, it says degree in etiology, but you could cross that out and you can put your child's um, conditions that, that you are programming for. So whatever might challenge your child, you could write it in there and then someone knows exactly what, what your challenges are and what you're doing to help your child. Then audition, you can look at hierarchies. Um, when we talk about audition, we talk about auditory memory mostly, but it's also a, a child's ability to listen in noise. And some children with um, autism have trouble listening when there's competing noise. And you might want to really assess your child in this area to find out what is their strongest mode for learning language. Is it auditory or is it visual? And this section could help you do that by looking at some auditory hierarchies. And Andrew mentioned that on the Spokal app, you'll find all kinds of different um, typical development hierarchies across all areas. So you, you could find um, many things to help you on the Spokal app. Then we talked about uh, receptive language and how you can measure receptive language and expressive language. And this is the, the pre-verbal form. There was also um, a verbal form, Andrew. We might just get the slide with the verbal form. And it's all about um, checking your child's uh, number of words that they know, that they understand, and the number of words that they say. And also um, finding out when they talk, you know, do they typically talk in one word phrases or two or three? And there are many different ways for you to plot this on. Again, typical hierarchies. And um, the Spokal app has many, and I spoke about quite a few last time too that that could help you determine. And so receptive language is what your child understands. And that's kind of hard to really pinpoint without testing, testing, testing. Um, expressive language is what your child says spontaneously. Not if they imitate what you say, but what they say all on their own with no prompting from you. I anything else in that area, Andrew? Or I More think in depth well. now? Thank you. Okay. All right. So then what we want to, want to talk about today is your child's speech production and then their general development and then how you use all of this information to get to the most important part of this form and that is um, determining your child's functioning age. So uh, a little bit about speech then. Uh, it, we just like to keep track of how your child um, says words and says sounds and you can do that yourself very easily or as I spoke about last month, if you are being guided by a teacher or a therapist, both of you together can fill out this form so that um, you're both in agreement about your child's um, abilities and the important the important thing I think for all therapists and all teachers to understand is that parents know their kids the best. And we really need parents to help us when we fill out a current level of functioning form because we're only with your child, you know, an hour a week or maybe um, at school, um, a few hours a day at school, but we don't see them nearly like you do at home in their natural environment where they're relaxed and where they 
probably communicate the most. So uh, again, when you look at your child and how he says words or sounds, there are many um, uh, hierarchies, typical development hierarchies for speech sounds. And you can uh, find a hierarchy. Uh, Andrew, in the Spokal app, do you have various languages as well? Or, in, or English only or? We do. So in the Spokal app, uh, we have Bahasa Indonesian um, and English at the moment. So mm -hmm. in terms of speech development in the app, that is coming in the second program for hearing loss, where we will be starting with speech. So in the first mm -hmm. hearing loss program, um, it's just your early bowels and babbling, but we will be moving to speech in the second program that will be released in the next few months. Right. So, so when you look at a child's uh, speech production, you're looking at what Andrew just said. You're looking at vowels. You're also going to look at all the consonants in your words. And then on the form, I have a section on uh, vocal quality. So what, what does your child sound like when he speaks? Does it sound... Um, natural, the way you speak and the way his peers speak, or uh, does he have a, a tense voice or a high-pitched voice? Um, is it is it um, very start and stop and start and stop and not fluid? You can write down lots of descriptors here about your child's vocal quality. And when you're looking at the sounds that your child should be able to say in isolation or in words or in phrases, you go to a typical development chart so that uh, you can see what's appropriate for your child's age. And remember that when we talk about your child, we're going to be talking about your child's chronological age, but we're also going to be talking about your child's developmental age. And those can be different. And that's, what, that's why we're filling out the CLF form to find out your child's developmental age or functioning age. And is it different than the chronological age? And if it is, we're going to write goals to help us catch that developmental age up to the chronological age whenever possible. So a good place to look for uh, different languages and the speech development or the phoneme development is ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing Association. They have many, many uh, forms that you can download for free on their website of all different languages. They really try to keep abreast of many different languages um, throughout the world so that therapists and parents can download natural hierarchies. And, um, and so if, you're, if you need something other than English or Bahasa Indonesian, you can go to ASHA. That's that's one place. And many, you can Google in your own country too. Sorry, Andrew, I can see you want to say something. Yeah, so with that, Cheryl, we will put a link to the ASHA site onto our website. And ASHA is A-S-H-A, right? Yes, yes. American Speech and Hearing Association. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So again, uh, speech is going to be very individual for your child and for your language that you're speaking at home. And maybe your child is learning English as well. So you can compare the two languages. And many teachers, therapists, and parents, when they fill out a CLF form, they might fill out part of it. You know, they'll, they'll have one section for the home language and they'll have a section for English if the child is also learning English or any, any combination thereof, um, whatever your child is, is learning. And you can keep track of both languages that way. Or you can have a CLF dedicated to your home language and a CLF dedicated to English. Uh, Cheryl, so, I might, I've just got uh, a question here yeah. that I think we might um, address now. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. What is the difference between functioning or developing age? So de developmental age and functioning age are essentially the same thing. It's, it's where is your child performing right now? What are they able to do uh, right now? And then you look at that age that you come up with and see what, how it compares to their chronological age. It might be exactly the same or it might be slightly behind. 
or it might be a lot behind, or in some cases it could be slightly ahead, and that means that you don't have a gap. You're actually working with your child to, to make sure they reach their individual potential, which could be um, ahead of their chronological age. So chronological age is a fixed age for your child. It is based purely on when they were born. So date they were born and how old are they now? It, it doesn't change, it can never change. But a functioning or a developmental age changes all the time. And when our children have additional difficulties, often that functional age or developmental age is below their chronological age. And our goal is to get them caught up to their chronological age, if at all possible. We want our children to be synchronous. And once the developmental or functional age catches up to their chrono chronological age, then they're in synchrony and they can keep moving forward. The other thing we want to do is when there is a delay, we want all the different areas to be working in synchrony as we catch the child up. So your child might have a delay in receptive language and expressive language. Well, then they probably also have a delay in their speech or their articulation, the way they say things. So we want to make sure that we are synchronous in our goal setting so that everything's developing together and we don't end up with big gaps and splinter skills. So synchrony is really important for your child and you won't be able to be synchronous unless you know exactly where your child is functioning in each area. Thanks, Cheryl. And just following on mm -hmm. from that, so another question. If I suspect there is something wrong with my child, if I fill in the form and I see that my child is delayed six months, should I be concerned? How much delay is a delay? Oh, that's such a great question, you know, and I'm so glad you asked that question because children develop at their own rate also. So, you know, when I say that children should be functioning at their chronological age, again, uh, every, you know, the, the average, the bell curve or the average for children, that thing right in the middle is where the majority of children are functioning. But then off to one side and off to the other side is also within normal. There's a normal range. And you can check with your teachers and your therapist to see how much delay is delay. Uh, and it, and it, it's gonna vary with each, with each child. But I think if you're getting into the six month uh, range and it's pretty solid across all the areas, you might want to look at writing some goals and see if you can move your child on, along a bit quicker. But that's such a great question and thank you because uh, average is, is a wide range. And I think, I think what you said is really important, Cheryl, in that for parents, if you're not sure of where your child sits in terms of their um, developmental age, then this is a really great thing to chat about with your therapist because your therapist should be able to help you understand where your child, um, where they're at. And if there is a gap, what is that gap? Mm. Yeah. And uh, one more thing about the speech is I talked, I talked about it before, but I just want to recap that speech is not just about articulation. You know, some children can say individual sounds very well, or some children can put all the sounds into a single word very well. But then when they start making phrases, combining words together and making short phrases and sentences, if their prosody, the way, you know, the musical tilt of their voice or their rate or rhythm isn't, doesn't sound natural the way you speak or the way their siblings speak, then that's an area that you need to address. And it's not just about good articulation, it's about co-articulation or putting words and, and sounds together as you speak naturally. Right, so, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me another question. No, 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 I think we've covered that really well. Thank you. Uh -huh. And so then uh, if we put the form up again, you can see that the next session, next section is about general development. And for me, this is the really, really important section. 
um, you'll see that there's six areas there for you to consider when you're looking at your child. There's fine motor, gross motor, self-help, language, and social emotional. And I talk about, um, so a child that doesn't have much language or a child um, that we want to really figure out what their cognition is, we're going to look at nonverbal things. And I'll just give you some, um, you know, just brief examples of what nonverbal cognition looks like. In other words, it's, it's what's going on in your child's head while they're playing, but they can't tell you because they don't have the language to tell you that that's in there. So for example, if you gave your child a dollhouse and the furniture was all in a box, and they, and they took the furniture out and they could put all of the kitchen things in the kitchen and they could put the bedroom things in the bedroom and they could put the living room or lounge room things in the lounge room. Cognitively, there's an age where children can do that. Your child might not be able to tell you that those are kitchen things. Those are lounge room things. Those are bedroom things. Those are bathroom things. They don't have the language to tell you, but up here, Cognitively, they know that those are categories and they put those things together in the right room in the house. Another thing children do is separate things by uh, color. They might put all the blue toys together and all the yellow toys together, or they might, they might categorize uh, by like items. So they might put all the dogs together, all the cars together, all the trucks together. And you watch your child play and see what they do, and that can give you a nonverbal uh, cognitive age for your child. And that the reason that's important is we can't always tell what what their cognitive level is if their language is delayed, and we want we want to know that. Carol, I wonder if maybe now's a good time um, if you could just talk a little bit about play versus testing. Yeah, so, uh, so often, that, that's why receptive language is so difficult to really measure in children because you can't do it without testing. And, and I see a lot of parents, teachers, therapists saying to a child, what's that, what's that, point to this, point to that, do this, do that, that's testing. And I came to an epiphany in my therapy probably 10 years ago where I decided I'm not testing kids anymore. I'm just going to play with kids. I'm going to give them opportunities to use their spontaneous language. And I'm going to observe and see what they're, what they're able to do. And for me, therapy got a lot more fun. It got a lot easier and progress was a lot quicker because I had no behavior problems because I wasn't testing. So, um, to, to find out your child's nonverbal cognition, you just set up some toys. You can be guided by developmental checklists. Another thing that uh, you can see is, can a child cut with scissors, cut on a line? Now, part of that's fine motor, but part of that's cognition. Can your child stack blocks up? Part of that's fine motor, but part of that's cognition. And you're just playing. You're not telling them they, you know, do this, do that, do that. You're stacking blocks, they'll stack blocks. And you observe how many they can stack up. And when you get developmental hierarchies uh, like this, then you will see um, how many blocks and what size blocks children should be able to stack up for their age. Is that um pretty what you want me to say yep, or i think you've covered more? it well thank you okay okay oh All sorry. Right. so then sorry i just have a yep. question here carrying on from mm -hmm. that um yeah. so when you were just playing to look at the cognition is there a form you use so that you know what to look at and if the child is always lining things up what is that telling you yeah so there are lots of hierarchies for cognition and you have to pick out the nonverbal um, things that, that you want to check if your child can do while you're, while you're playing. And, the, and I've mentioned a few of those things. So yes, you, would, you can download hierarchies um, from the Spokal app. You can get hierarchies on the internet. 
Uh, you can ask your teacher or your therapist for what they use to look at these areas and then um, just go through it and see what your child can do. And they're always separated by age. They're going to go, you know, birth to one year, one year to two years and so forth. So you can pick right around your child's chronological age and, and look below it at, at that age and above that age to see what, what they're able to do. And the second part of the question, Andrew, was, um, if, if a child is always lining things up, what does oh, yeah. that tell you? Well, um, you know, some people say that lining toys up and not doing any um, creative play with them uh, is, is a low-level skill that, that sometimes children do that when they are on the um, spectrum. But not always. I mean, some kids just really like their world orderly, and you would never diagnose a child just based on lining things up. But what you want to do with a child that lines things up is show them creative ways to play with the things they're lining up and see if they'll imitate you doing a higher level play than just lining things up. Thank you. Hmm. So, so that's a little bit about nonverbal cognition. You also want to check what your child can do in gross motor. And you, again, can download um, normal gross motor development hierarchies and look at around your child's age. You know, can they um, jump with both feet together? Can they hop on one leg? Uh, there's so many different uh, gross motor skills for children from birth again all the way through riding um, a two-wheel bicycle with no training wheels and, and it, just many, many things in gross motor. So you want to find out what age bracket your child is in, where they've completed the earlier age bracket and they're working on the skills in this age bracket, then that's their, fun their functioning age in gross motor. And then fine motor, much the same again. So can they hold a pencil with the pincer grip or do they use the caveman grip? There's very specific ages attached to both of those. Uh, can they thread beads on a string? Can they put uh, puzzles together? Puzzles with a little handle that you put into a, to a, to a what, Andrew? <laughs> put them into the puzzle board into in the, the shape. Board. Yeah. Yeah. Or a jigsaw puzzle where the all the pieces are there and they have to piece it together themselves. Uh, every puzzle has an age associated with it and you can find that out. Uh, again, I said stacking blocks was um, cog cognitive, but also fine motor. And shape sorters, that's cognitive, but also fine motor to twist the shapes around and make them fall into the shape sorter ball. So I love playing with children with all the fine motor and gross motor lists and finding out exactly what their functioning age is. When you figure it out, you write it in the box on the form under gross motor, fine motor, nonverbal cognition. There's a language section in this um, section, but I just put a big X through it because um, that's actually based on an instrument I used to use called the Learning Accomplishment Profile. We already have a, a language age up above. We, we talked about it in the last webinar. And you leave that one blank. And then there's self-help. So can your child get himself a drink? Can your child pull up their own pants? Is your child uh, toilet trained? Can they ask for help? Again, many, many hierarchy uh, lists out there for you to choose from for self-help for your child. Once you figure out what their functioning age is, write it in that box. And um, Andrew, can, I can we just put the form up again for people to see? Yep. Before we right? do it, can I just, um, a, a couple of yes, questions please. which are connected yeah. to what we've been talking about. I guess firstly, sure, sure. Um, so you've talked about checklists and you know we can find them online. We will provide um, some checklists on our website to make it easier for you guys out there. And by the way, <laughs> welcome to everyone um, that's joined us later on Facebook as well as other social media platforms. Thanks for joining us. Um, so often these um, 
um, hierarchies are like zero to three months, three to six months, six to nine months, three, three to six months apart. Would you be concerned if your child, say in a three month period or six month period, um, got 80% of the um, skills that were listed there in any one of these gross motor, fine motor language, um, self-help and all that sort of thing, and they didn't have that, that 20%, would you, would you be okay with that? Or when would you start to show concern? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, it's like that, that um, average, the bell curve that I talked about before. 80% is certainly within normal limits, we would say in our profession, within normal limits. And you just work on that 20% that your child doesn't have yet. But again, children are going to come to skills uh, when they're ready to come to them and when they have all of the prerequisite skills in place. And it's about um, if your child doesn't have 20% of those skills, but they probably have a year to achieve them, where are you in that year? It's quite a big block of time. Or if they go in three month or six month, you have that amount of time to, to work on those skills with your child. It's about exposing them to those. I know in many, many countries, you know, children don't ride bicycles. And so you might want to look at what's typical for your culture, not the uh, American or Australian culture where a lot of these lists are made. So look online in your own countries and find out what's typical for your country in these areas. Great, thank you. And we have a really great question here, which is, um, so when we're looking at fine motor, gross motor skills, how are they related to language development? I mean, are they? Well, that's, so, that's such a great question. Again, wow, I think some of you should be uh, giving this webinar. Yes, they're very, very um, related to language. And we look at babies and they, babies have milestones of sitting up on their own, of crawling, and that uh, gross motor activity is essential prerequisite to actually producing language. And then there's other things like turn taking, um, joint attention, things like that, the pragmatics of language that have to be in place before a child will speak. So fine motor and gross motor are very, very linked to language in the early developing baby and toddler. And uh, if your child has some splinter skills in, in these areas, working on them could help achieve synchrony, which could help language develop at a faster rate. Great, Great question. Explain what you mean by splinter skills. Yeah, so splinter skills are a child might uh, be able to stack up many, 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 many blocks, well, perhaps above their chronological age, but then they don't have any creative play skills. They're not, uh, they're not playing with objects the way we would use them in real life. They're not imitating real life. So their, their creative play skills are quite low, but, but then in this fine motor, non-verbal cognitive area, they were able to stack up, say, 15 blocks. We consider that a, a splinter skill. So we want to work in the lower areas so that the child catches up and achieves synchrony. And another question here is, can you give an example of how to get information about a child's nonverbal cognition without testing? Yeah, playing. So, so that's what I was saying. Just sit down with your list of things that are nonverbal uh, cognitive activities um, or skills and just play and see if your child can, can play alongside you and do what you're doing. So see if your child can stack those blocks. See if your child can put that puzzle together. Um, see if your child can do that shape sorter. There are many, many skills skills listed in each age division and just sit down and play. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. And sometimes um, it can be difficult kind of getting away from that testing um, of just asking those questions and just actually engage in imaginative play with the child. 
um, because you can learn so much just through watching and observing. And I know it's spoken sort of our standard call is stop, look, listen, acknowledge. So if you're testing, it's very hard to stop, look, listen, and then acknowledge. Whereas if you're playing, um, then it's quite, it, it's easier to step back and just take it all in from an observational perspective. Um, and we do have information in our app on stop, look, listen, and acknowledge. Um, Good, super. So I've just got another, another question here. With other children, mm -hmm. like eight or nine, but their play skills are still at a lower age. So higher, higher age, lower play skill age. How can I provide more appropriate activities that they can do to achieve their age appropriate skills? Well, uh, so play skills are also dependent on language the older you get. So if make-believe play is what your child should be doing at eight or nine or cooperative uh, make-believe play, that takes a lot of language. So this is why it's so important to find out where your child is functioning across all areas. And that's where you have to really um, gear your, your work, your goals with your child. Yes, they're eight or nine, but they may actually be functioning more at, say, six or seven. So you have to work in that sweet spot. We call it the sweet spot of where your child's ready to learn those skills. And it might seem too low a level for the chronological age. And you might be able to use uh, toys that are more appropriate to the age level that say superhero things but you're working on lower level uh, play with them using perhaps toys that their peers are playing with. Then I don't know if that helps or not. Maybe you could let me know. Yeah, yeah I think, I think um, the important thing is to also by eight or nine, most children kind of have preferences in terms of what they're interested in as well. So as you said, many eight and nine year olds really into superheroes and comics and that sort of stuff. So yeah, I guess taking a lead from the child as well. Mm. Yes. So that's, uh, that is that general development area down there. So you're going to look at gross motor, fine motor, self-help, nonverbal cognition. You're going to look at the, the age equivalencies that you're getting. So you're going to say, oh, my child's functioning, you know, within this three-month age band. And if they're all the same, then your child's synchronous across those areas. Then look at your chronological age. And is it the same or is it delayed? And if it's delayed, how much is it delayed? Often, fine motor, gross motor, self-help, and nonverbal cognition are equal to the child's chronological age. And that tells us we don't have a developmental delay. We have a specific language and speech delay that we can now address. If you then see that your child's functioning age down here, the developmental areas of fine motor, gross motor are delayed below the chronological age, then you know that you have a general broad delay across all areas and you're programming for all the areas. So does that make sense, Andrew? Did that make sense to you or should I explain it in another way? Okay, all right. Yeah, and so by doing this form, you then know what are you looking at? Are you looking at a global delay where every area is below the chronological age or develop me, developmentally down at the bottom, it's equivalent to my chronological age and I'm really just working on speech and language and I can write goals in those areas. And it, it's just telling you what areas you need to write goals in. So at the very bottom of the form, there's a place for you to write a CLF age. And you, you are writing there the age that you've come up with that say in receptive language, your child was functioning at the three-year-old level. In expressive language, they were functioning at the two-year-old level. In speech, they were at the two-year-old level. Then you average those 
and that's your current level of functioning age. So you're going to then write long-term goals for your child at that age level, not at their chronological age and not at gross motor, fine motor, nonverbal cognition, because that's not delayed either. You're starting with your functioning, your current level of functioning age that you wrote in the box at the bottom of the form. Cheryl, I guess it's just, and I'm conscious of the time here, we've got about 11 mm -hmm. minutes to go. And we do have yeah. a few questions from last week, uh, last month, sorry. Um, so I guess two things. Um, so we've talked about that it's really critical to engage in creative play and really be observant in terms of what your child mm -hmm. is doing when you're looking at checklists for all these core developmental areas. But there will be there will be times when you will assess a child, right, formally to get that yeah. information. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, how frequently would you suggest um, a parent or a therapist go back to the CLF and review it and maybe create another CLF? Right. Super. Thanks. So assessment, yes. This is called functional assessment. The CLF is functional assessment. And you're doing it based on your observations and, and playing with your child and comparing your child to typical hierarchies of development in all the areas. Children also need to be formally assessed using standardized uh, tests because we want, we want to be able to compare functional with standardized hopefully they correlate and the more experience your child gets with formal standardized tests the closer that correlation will become because first they have to learn how to take a test once they once you know they have information once you know they've learned some language then you can give them a formal test and see how they're comparing to their to their age equivalent peers and the only way we can compare these two pieces of information is if you're therapist or teacher gives you the age equivalency from a standardized test. Kids should receive standardized testing at least annually. If it goes more than a year, you don't know if you're making any progress. And the second part of that question, I have a one item auditory memory. Oh, That's the okay. CLF. I no, I got I, it. Can I just so, um, add something yeah, sure. to what you just said? Or just um, yeah. ex ex expand on that. So I think you know, as a therapist, when you assess a child using a standardized assessment, you're assessing them at a, it's a snapshot in time of what that child can do in the room under those conditions, right? And it's very specific. So they have to look at the picture and name it, or they have to identify it. So it's very specific. And often, you know, parents and the therapists will come out and say, you know, my, my child knows more than that. I know that he knows. Um, I know that he knows how to categorize things, or I know that he knows what a bird is, um, but he didn't do it there. And so I think that's really important, as Cheryl said, that the CLF is a functional test. It's what they can actually do in everyday life, and assessment is what they can do right now, um, given the questions that have been asked of them of that assessment. So I think. You know, the CLF is a really nice adjunct to your formal assessments because it often gives a, a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And again, we're looking for correlation. And if they don't correlate, why not? Mm -hmm. So, you know, as Andrew said, the standardized test is just how well your child did right then on that day with that test with that examiner. And if there's no rapport with the examiner or they've never had a formal assessment before, there's no way they're going to achieve their best on that day. And, and that's what you want. You always want all the information you can get, then you look at it objectively. You're looking for correlation. If it doesn't, why not? Sometimes on the CLF, we've overestimated the child's abilities and it's a lot higher than on the standardized. And we have to be honest and say, yeah, maybe my child doesn't really say that many words spontaneously. It might be more imitated. So it goes both ways. It goes both ways. Now the I CLF, I think, Oh, go ahead. Yep. So, um, go, Andrew. And the follow-up to that was, how often would you recommend that we check the right. CLF? Yeah. So I think the CLF should be filled out six monthly at the longest interval. 
and again, it's so we can see if the child's progressing and write new goals for the child. So we keep them moving forward. It's all about moving forward. I said last month, the whole reason I developed the CLF form was so that the therapists that I was training could find out exactly where the kids were and write appropriate goals to move them forward. Many, many of the therapists were actually behind their children. And the children were functioning much higher than where the, the therapist pitched their goals. So it's all about if there's a delay, know where the child is, write goals, achieve the goals, move the child forward, then fill out another CLF every six months, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and mm -hmm. this is a question from last week, and I certainly think that you've um, talked about it, but we just might specifically talk about it in the context of the actual question. If on mm -hmm. the form their progress is very low, what next? Well, so this is great. And it's, you, you base it kind of on long-term goals. If they're not achieving the long-term long goals, you have to say, why not? Are they too hard or are they too big? Maybe you wrote a goal that said the child will learn 250, will, will produce 250 new words spontaneously. That's a huge goal. Maybe you need to break it down. Maybe you need to say, well, the child needs to learn five words in these six categories of, say, vehicles, fruit, furniture, clothing, whatever they might be. That's breaking the goal down so you can actually achieve it. And they might need to learn 10 new verbs and six new adjectives. So if a child is slow to progress, again, red flag, why? Why aren't they achieving these goals? Figure it out. Are they too hard? Do you need to break them into smaller steps? Or is there some underlying condition that we haven't even found out about yet? And, and I think that's really critical, Cheryl. I think that when you're looking at a functional profile and a standardized assessment, um, as therapists, it's our job to look at that data, to look at that information, analyze it, and figure out where the, where the breakdowns are, so where the challenges are, and what we need to do to mm. try and close that gap. Because everything we're talking about with the CLF is to close a gap. So between, as Cheryl's talked about, the chronological age and then the, the functional age, what they're, what they're able to do. So I have another question and we have mm -hmm. five minutes left. So I may okay, make this, I, sorry. Well, yes. let me start with one. I, have, I just briefly saw a question and I want to answer it because it's so simple. Okay, it's an easy one for me to answer. They wanted to know how you can find out what colors your child knows without testing. And you really, you can't, you can't know a child's receptive language without testing, but you can wait until they come out with it themselves. And I don't have a problem waiting for kids to come out with it themselves, either verbally or, or by using a nonverbal uh, chart that they might use or however they're going to communicate expressively. So you're just playing with your child and you might p pick up a toy and say, I've got a red truck and, and, they might get a toy and you might look at them expectantly and just see what they're going to say. Or you might gather all the red toys and say, I've got all the red toys. And just look at them and let them gather something and see what they say. I know it takes longer for expressive, but it's such a nicer way to play with a child than saying, what color's that? What color's that? What color's that? Because if they don't know the answer, they can't tell you and they feel terrible. If they know the answer, they'll say it spontaneously anyway. So just skip that testing bit and play and give them opportunities to use the language they have. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. And just on that, <laughs> children are very clever. They know when you're testing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they know when you're playing. And just take a yes. guess at what they prefer. <laughs> Who knew? Um, so very quickly, because we're now three minutes out of closing. Mm -hmm. So very, very yeah. quickly, if my child is not familiar with the therapist doing the assessment, and I'm, I know my child is able to do things, how will the assessment look like then? Well, if they're not familiar with the assessor, and they've never had a taken a, a standardized test before, it's, it's not going to be a good outcome, probably. But you just have to know that the first few times your child 
is assessed, uh, they just consider it a, a practice time for them to learn how to take standardized tests. And that's why you should start young. You know, children can take standardized vocab tests at two and a half. So just get them started. Tell your teachers, tell your therapists you want standardized testing done on a regular basis, and soon your child will get used to doing it. And you can practice it a little bit at home if you want. It is testing though, so don't make it don't make it an everyday thing. It's a once in a while thing to teach them how to take a test. Great. Um, really quickly, I'll squeeze one more question in. Um, and then that, this will be the last question. And then we'll ask Cheryl just to sort of um, finish up. Uh, how to check cognition development if the child is, I think the arrow going that way is younger than six. My symbols are No, great. I think it's... Or is it older yeah, than six? Great. Thank you, older than six. I knew that. Yeah. Um, what is the indicator to use? Same. You just, you, you need to find a hierarchy for your age and just look at the items on there, play with your child, checking those skills and see which skills in that list your child can do. There's, there are um, cognitive skill lists from birth all the way up to adulthood. Uh, not not all of them are nonverbal though. So, but you get into very intricate um, puzzles and you know being able to draw a line inside a path and copying shapes with a pen or pencil. There's many. So, you know, find a hierarchy checklist and look at the items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, mm -hmm. So just in closing, Cheryl, did you want to, is there anything you wanted to close with? Just, you know, I just really encourage each of you to try and fill out uh, the CLF form on your child. And it might be easiest to start at the bottom. Start with the general development things like self-help, fine motor, uh, social, emotional, gross motor, and get get your child's age in those areas. Then go up the form and look at some language hierarchies and try and figure out where your child is. And if you're working with a teacher or a therapist, it would be great if they would partner you in this and the, the two of you do it together and really get a good snapshot of where your child is right now. Thank you, Cheryl, so much. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we do have last month's webinar up on our website. Um, our website there is on the screen, www.spokal.com.au. We also do have uh, Cheryl's CLF form on the website. As I mentioned, we'll put a link to the ASHA website so that you can download forms. Uh, we'll also put together a few checklists that are commonly used and pop them onto our website as well. Um, Cheryl, there's been a lot of comments of thanks um, and appreciation for the last two webinars that you presented for Spokal. Um, but I want to thank you very much for presenting on something that I think is just so critical, um, is really understanding your child's current level of function. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully we teased out today a little bit about how that is quite different from a formal and standardized assessment. Um, but from both, you can get goals, goals for your child, um, and then work on strategies on how to close that gap. Because with all our children, whatever challenges they have, we want to try and close the gap as much as possible with each child. So thank you, Cheryl. It's been a fabulous um, two presentations. Really appreciate it. Enjoy your bushland. I know it's like minus five degrees there today, <laughs> which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And this webinar will also be on our website. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time this Saturday to join us. We will be back next month with another webinar. We'll let you know about that shortly. Everyone, enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Stay well. From all of us at Spokal, bye.